Howdy, everybody. I'm Sam Feifel. I'm a journalist with the Portland Phoenix and the Maine Beacon and a variety of other sources here in the state of Maine. And welcome to Pathways to Progress. This is a monthly show where we talk about progressive issues that affect the city of Portland and the state of Maine and who knows, maybe the country at large, we'll find out. Uh, normally it's hosted by Lisa Savage. She uh, is gallivanting about the country and visiting with her grandchildren, so uh, I am very happy to take over for her. Uh, joining us today, as uh, every month, is Victoria Pelletier. How are you doing, Victoria? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. You are the District 2 uh, City Councilor here in the City of Portland. We also have Roberto Rodriguez. How are you doing, Roberto? I'm doing good. Good to be back. And Roberto is our at-large counselor here <laughs> in the City of Portland. And, uh, you know, I think what's on everybody's mind nowadays is that you guys are going to be back in person for the first time in, what, two years? More than that? It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What what are you expecting to happen? Uh, how do you think it's going to be different, Victoria? Oh my gosh, yeah, it's going to be strange because I don't think that they've been in person. Even the the counselors from 2020 that got elected, I don't think have been in person. So it's going to be interesting, I think, for us all to be back. Um, and I know that I did see a picture of Chambers, and they have plexiglass in between all of us, which will, which is you know I think very specific specific of the times, but. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, part of me is excited to go back. I think that the conversations will flow differently now that we're like back in person. We can see each other's faces and look directly into each other's eyes. Um, the public comment will be different as we, you know, get underway with people being able to come back into City Hall. And so I, I'm hoping that it adds another energy and a layer of kind of more excitement for people to actually come in and see us and make their, their public comment and get to watch us live. Uh, you know, person to person, but I'm also, it's like a little nerve wracking that, yeah, we'll, I bet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that I think we the, won't be able to hide anymore. Yeah. We'll be like, you know, front and center. Uh, can't just like you know, turn off the camera. Can't turn off yeah. the camera. Yeah, no, that's not possible now. So it'll be, it'll be interesting, but I'm excited. Yeah. And I mean, I think Roberto, the big question is, what are you going to wear? It's a great question, right? <laughs> and, and so this is really interesting because, you know, and it has been two years. It was March uh, middle of March of 2020 when yeah. everything went remote. The third, March 13th is when the schools closed. Um, and so in, in Zoom land, everything changed. Like the etiquette is different. Um, so a good example is in city council, when the counselors speak, you're supposed to stand up and speak. Oh. Uh, but clearly in Zoom, that doesn't happen. So now that we're going back, you know, is it like, it, first of all, it makes you think like, what's the point of standing? It's a tradition and I guess there's some Maybe there's there's some sort of precedence for it, but what's the meaning? Does it really impact the the, the, the quality of the policy that or your, your your legislating ability? Probably not. So um, do we go back? Do we rethink what you know in person legislative looks like? Um, obviously, we're talking about the members of the public being able to engage via Zoom, so that's already going to be a difference. Um, so I just think it's an opportunity to rethink how we how we legislate. Um, I see a lot of value, like like Tori said, right? Like being able to see someone in person, um, even as as we've returned in other aspects of life to in person, like the, the shared humanity. I think that that we have um, shines through, and that alone, I think, brings tons of value to to any kind of collaborative work and certainly public service. So um, hopefully, hopefully, it, it does you know sum up to us being better, better you know elected officials. Yeah, it's kind of hard to have an esprit de corps when you're just seeing people through these video screens. Uh, <laughs> We've definitely experienced that. Uh, some people might know I'm the chair of the school board up in Gray New Gloucester. And when we got back in person, uh, it definitely felt like we were all in this together in a way that we weren't, you know? And I, I think we really appreciated seeing each other. Have you been able, Victoria, do you feel like to build a relationship with other city councilors? Like, do you, do you meet offline? Or, you know, how do you get to know them? Yeah, I think that's the part that is tough. Um, because we, we're in a pandemic, but also all of us have jobs and personal lives. And so like, this is not the only thing that we do. So I think it's really hard, you know, pandemic aside to like really meet and connect. And like, there's just so, there's so much happening. And I did say the other day after one of our meetings, it was like a particularly difficult meeting. I think we had in January or February. And I was like, we should do like a ropes course or something. Yes. Cause we, do, yeah. <laughs> we, do, we don't know each other well and i think because of that 
it's hard to sometimes like collectively like come together when we're on a council meeting because like two we can only have two people be together at one time that are counselors and if we have three or more then it has to be a public meeting there has to be public notice about right. it yeah. and so i think if we could have something that's like a ropes course or some kind of like team building thing i think that would help for us to be more cohesive in a lot of the conversations that we have just to get to know each other better because it's like we have different people from different walks of life all suddenly on a council together making decisions and that really impacts like I think our, our personal relationships and we if you don't know someone and you can't really build that level of trust, I think it's really hard. So I think that trust is super important. Yeah, right? is, we need outward balance. You know, you want you want, well, you want to have these difficult conversations, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you you want to believe that we're all coming from a different place and we're gonna meet in the middle. But if you don't trust someone to be sort of arguing in good faith or you know, that can really affect your ability to extend yourself, right? Absolutely. And um I think that um Again, I think being remote certainly interferes with that. Um, the nature of the work, you know, it's not conducive to that. I think that you get pulled in so many different directions just by the, the, the issues that we're dealing with, the constituencies that we're representing. Um, so it, you have to go out of your way to create those relationships. And like Tori said, we have jobs. We live full lives. Well, let's you, talk you about that a little bit. This, well, let's right? talk yeah. about that, right? We, yeah. you know, I was going to bring up the, you know, the commission's work, right? And, and one of the sort of things that are swirling out there is, you know, paying counselors more or making them more of a sort of semi-professional council, that kind of thing. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Like, you know, what is it like to volunteer the amount of time that it requires? Yeah, um, so it's, I think there's, there's a great level of privilege to just to be able to do this, right? Like, I think about the level of financial security that I have in my life, that I can take a chance to do this job that takes up, like, ridiculous amount of hours that are really not paid for. Um, yes, we get a stipend. Um, we get access to pretty good health health benefits. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, That's pretty yeah, good. Yeah, and the and dopest thing is that we get a parking pass. So <laughs> yeah, so if I'm in if I'm doing city business, like if I go out and meet with a constituent, having coffee, having meeting someone for lunch, or, or even now that we're gonna have to go to city hall for meetings, you know, you gotta park on city on you know on on street parking. Um, so the pass, I think that's dope. Um, and then, um, but for the most part, you know, you're you're spending ridiculous amounts of time on email. We've talked a lot about emails in mm -hmm. here, um, and the, you know that's not compensated time. And but it's a responsibility that we take. So again, tons of privilege in me being able to do that with my time. Um, I think that compensating us uh, with a higher wage, I think that that's one way to break the barrier to having more people have access to it. I think that there's a lot of other things that interfere with why someone would want to run for office. Um, the arena itself is not like inviting, particularly for people of color. This is not like you come in here and as much as you want to be an advocate, like you got to realize that this is, you know, white supremacy does not take a break when you get elected. It, right. The opposite, it intensifies. So when you're advocating for marginalized communities, when you're advocating for equity, you know, this is probably not the most effective place to do it. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Yeah. Um, but wages will probably have an impact and it will probably open the door for many people to run for office. Yeah, well that's been an issue I know uh, with the charter commissioners, right? Uh, we've seen some of the you know, commissioners of color talk about, it seems to be there's a little bit of a different standard between the feedback that they get and the feedback that some of the white members get. Uh, what's your, been ex your experience in terms of the feedback that you get? Do you feel as though you get a different kind of feedback than some of your fellow counselors? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I get some different feedback, and I think I talked about this at the last uh, taping that I'll get, we will get emails as, as a full counsel, and I will get the same email from that same person. Very different tone from, from yeah. that individual towards me. Uh, specifically, but I think you know when we're talking about when you're, so not to cut you off, but when yeah. you're walking around the streets, yeah, do you feel like you're recognized as a counselor? Uh, more and more now, and I think it's because I, I came out, you know, with like a bang. So I think more people are recognizing me. It's and not do like you I'm, feel comfortable being recognized on the street as a counselor? Um, you know, yeah, I, it depends on where. Like I've been, you know recognize well like I'm on my morning jog and yeah, that's, that's not a, a place weird. that I really yeah. want to talk about politics um, you know or I'm out to dinner and that's not really a place that I want to have a conversation about something that a vote that I made but I think that that's that is part of it and in a way I think that that is what makes 
leading in Portland like really great for people is that you can you will see your counselors out and I think I said this at our last meeting like you'll see me out on a jog you can DM your counselors and you know that we exist and we'll, we'll be writing you back you'll see us out to dinner and on, on a walk and whatever we don't live in this in this place where like we're shielded by security guards and we have bouncers right, yeah. and like you can't access us like you'll see us everywhere and I think that's what's really cool about leading in Portland because yeah, you can direct message your counselors on Instagram and you know that we're gonna see it and write back to you. And I love utilizing that in order to communicate with people and I think that that makes Portland really unique and the fact that we are very intense with politics here, but we're also a large enough town. We haven't morphed into this city where we can be anonymous and so like we can respond to people and like you'll see me out at your favorite coffee shop or like your favorite restaurant. I'll be sitting down and doing the same thing that you're doing. And I think like that adds into like, we're just like you. We're like regular people that happen to be counselors. I always say that. So you'll see me out, you know, eating my pasta and I'm doing the same thing that you're doing and trying to just exist and make Portland a better place. And I think that helps with humanizing us because I think people sometimes think like, oh, they're, they're counselors and they're, they don't care about us. They're like in another, you know, league. Right. They don't care about what, what we deal with when the contrary is the reason I became a counselor is because I, I care so much that I want to make sure that I'm part of that conversation. And I am a regular person that exists in Portland that now has the counselor title, but is really working hard to, to make positive change. And you'll see that and you'll see me out and about. So, yeah. And yeah. that's also something that, you know, uh, some of the kind of anti-government libertarian people will push is that, oh, you know, the political class doesn't care about us. And I think it's important to, you know, be a person who is visible and make sure, you know, that people don't think that you're, you know, in some way, you know, above or detached. Uh, it can kind of bite you sometime. I remember when I was a school teacher, uh, I would uh, go get a six pack at the grocery store and the kid checking me out be like, oh, Mr. Fife, we're going to have a party tonight. You know, it's like, well, like, I'm just trying to six pack, you know. Um, does that, you know, do you agree with Victoria? And, you know, talk a little bit also about, um, you know, the small town means that you're kind of involved in everything. Like you're out there kind of commenting on the commission because you care about Portland, but, you know, you're a counselor and you, you wear a lot of hats, you know. It's not like counselor is the only hat you wear. Absolutely. I think that, um, so I, served, I served on the school board for five years and so, Something that was always important to, and, and you know, literally, literally your attorneys would remind you, you don't lose your First Amendment right when you get elected, right? So you still have, you still have an opinion as, as an individual, and you, and you live in this city where, you know, you can, you can potentially testify. So, for example, testifying at the Charter Commission, uh, even though I'm a counselor, you know, I have an opinion about an issue that they have. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable expressing it. Um, but I know that there are people that might not necessarily agree with that. Um, so th I think that being able to identify as an individual and, and, to, and to think that you, you have some sort of value to share um, with your experiences and your opinions, I think that that's separate of being a counselor. A counselor is being a representative, right? Like uh, there's a constituency that I'm trying to listen to and that I'm trying to um, consider when I make decisions that impact everyone else. And then separate of that, there's this guy who's a, a, an individual and a small business owner, actually. You were talking about, you know, the, 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 people that, the way that people hold you accountable. We've had, you know, people on the council whose, you know, your jobs, your business um, is having to pay consequences for votes that you're taking. Like, that's that line that is that. That's, that's a tough spot to be in, right? Tough, like, you know, who's, <laughs> people are going to accuse you of trying to feather your own nest. People are going to try to accuse you of, you know, retribution against your political enemies, all that kind of thing. Um, and even something like the Charter Commission, right? You know, how do you sort of think about, are you just watching it and whatever happens, happens? Do you feel like you have a voice in it? Um, you know, what do you think is the proper role for you as a counselor as this kind of big deal is happening over there? I mean, I, prior to being a counselor, I was like really invested in the Charter Commission race and like what was happening. and. Like, yeah, I'm a counselor for, we're counselors for three years, but like that doesn't mean that like, okay, I'm a counselor now, I can't, I can't possibly speak on anything. And I think, again, it goes back to people think that we're not like regular people that will be affected by this. So I still, you know, speak at, at charter meetings when I can, and I really try and make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on. We're all going to vote on it at the end of the day. It's not like counselors get to abstain from these votes. And so like, we should get our, our equal say, even though we're, we're counselors now. And it's like, oh my gosh, well, you're biased, blah, blah, blah. But again, I think it goes back to like the pay conversation. 
we're living in, we're existing in this world where we're expected to be on call all the time. We're expected to answer emails all the time, read the council documents and agendas and be, pre be prepared. And we're doing that on top of our regular jobs. And so like talking about council pay, I do think counselors should be paid. I think that opens up a whole world of individuals that could run from like parents to service industry people to people that are working as baristas to people that are unhoused. I think that we're, if we really want council and leading in Portland to be equitable, then we need to start investing in the people that are leading the city and show that we value that opinion. So whether it affects me or it affects the next generation of counselors, I still think you know, counselors should be paid. And I think that we, as people who will get to vote and who have free speech, we are we have more of a right than anybody, I think, to, to really be able to weigh in. And I think people trying to take our voice away from us is just like, you know, it's just not realistic. Because again, I think it goes back to, yes, we're elected council people, but we still have a say and we get to vote just like everybody else. So, yeah. you know. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the two roles kind of interact, right? You're in budget season right now. People might not know, you know, how the budget is developed and all that sort of thing. So you're kind of monitoring over here something that might affect the budget, right? Oh, we change our city council, you know, pay or the city manager becomes a different type of role or we have a mayor, all this sort of thing. Um, you have all kinds of economic forces happening. Uh, how do you kind of compartmentalize the things that you need to think about, right? Like when you're approaching the budget conversation, mm -hmm. how do you sort of figure out what you know, your goals are gonna be or what your role is gonna be in that sort of budget development process? I mean, I think what's interesting is I'm never thinking about me. I'm actually always thinking about the generation that's gonna come after me and the, the path that I wanna pave for young people and young people of color to come after me. And so it's like, I always think, whatever we're doing is not gonna have any effect on me personally. I have a three year term, it's not gonna really impact me, but how will this change impact other individuals who wanna be counselors, especially young black people who really have, have never had that experience before and deserve a seat at that table. So I think in that is just advocacy around like, how will this have an impact in Portland and Portland leadership? How will this open more doors for young people and people of color? How will this make city politics more equitable? And it's never myself. And I think like that's what's so interesting about these conversations is it's never like, what does Tori want and how can I get it? It's more like, what will this mean for the next generation of young leaders? And how can I make sure that however I'm voting and whatever I'm advocating for will have an impact on that? Because like I could care less about me. Like I will always be able to like take care of myself. I'm gonna be fine. I'm only a counselor for like a, a specific period of time, but I wanna be able to create a pipeline line of younger people and again young people of color to be able to succeed and to be able to be parts of part of these conversations so when we talk about the budget when we talk about a mayor strong mayor versus city manager position when we talk about counselor pay I'm again thinking of how will this impact Portland and the direction that we're going in to make sure that as we diversify that we are able to be a city that really champions for everybody and is equitable for everybody. And if we can do that, and if I can do that on my way through my council career to make it better and easier and more equitable for the people that come after me, then like I'm I'm good with that. Like I can I can sleep I can sleep at night feeling like I, I really did my part in that. Yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna ask you the same question, right? So, you know, along those similar lines, it's budget season. Do you have goals for things that you'd like to see happen? Do you just wait for the report and kind of have an opinion on that? How do you sort of approach your role? You know, and it's a big number for the city of Portland. Even, you know, we were talking uh, sort of before the taping, just the schools alone, right? It's a big, not only is it a big number, but the number gets bigger every year and the uh, state gives you less money every year. So, you know, how do you sort of approach having goals versus we just gotta keep the lights on here? Yeah, I th so I think one of the biggest differences um, that I'm looking forward to experiencing in, in the municipal budget is um, in the school's budget, as you know, you don't have very many opportunities as a district to create revenue sources. So you, you rely a lot on what the state is going to give you for subsidy. Um, and in particular in Portland, that amount keeps decreasing. So creating a budget, um, and schools tend to be really good, right? We're, we're, we're built for, for having tough budgets, we're built for, for having um, really difficult decisions. Um, when, we are, when we have the city uh, municipal budget, I believe that we have opportunities for creating revenue. Um, so what I would like to explore is that, right? Like what are things that we can do to create more revenue that then we can we create uh, programming to deal with some of the issues that we know are gonna help our, our marginalized communities, our BIPOC communities. Particularly right now, I'm interested in, in having workforce development programming 
Um, we know that there are jobs out there that are going to pay really good for people. We just got to help people get those jobs. So it, maybe it's a certification, maybe it's a CDL license. We talked about the schools having open positions for drivers for months and not being able to fill them. So get people these licenses, get them a job. A lot of these folks, particularly in Portland, are immigrant members of our community or communities or excuse me, members of the immigrant community who just need a, a ESO class over at uh, at adult debt so that they can get their CDL license and then they get a dope paying job for the schools or for the city. Um, so we can we can make the investments. So anyways, one area to create revenue, for example, um, parking in the city. Um, I've been talking to people about it, raising the enforcement time from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. and particularly in the weekends. That's good. That could potentially create tons of revenue, um, and then that could that could create a, a you know a less stress on the budget. Um, that you know again allows us to think outside of the outside of the, the box. Another area I think also just key is to think about ARPA, you know, federal funding that we have access to. There's a reason that that money got sent directly to municipalities. So like they want us to spend that in what we think is important. You know, every time that you get funding that goes through the state, just like we said about the yeah. school, you don't want to rely on the state to give you money. That money is in our, like literally in our bank account, ready to spend however we want it. Um, Portland got $46 million. 23 has already been allocated. So we have $23 million that we're gonna allocate in the next few months. That's, that could potentially have a big impact long-term if we do it correctly and if we focus, you know, again, our, our, the communities that we know we've not invested in over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, we'd love to hear some more thoughts on that, right? So, you know, a big uh, conversation happening at the state level right now is uh, Governor Mills says, we've got a bunch of money, I'm gonna send 850 bucks to everybody. Uh, with my progressive lens on, that doesn't seem particularly progressive, right? Uh, seems like we could use a big pot of money to target people who are suffering, to really reduce harm. Uh, 850 bucks, if I got an $850 check, that's, you know, be nice. Uh, I'm not saying I don't have bills to pay, but that's not gonna make a significant difference in my life. Um, how do you sort of make sure that when you do have a pot of money, you target it towards things that will have a true impact in a progressive way? Yeah, I, I think, Again, it is having conversations with the people that are going to be most impacted and really making sure that they're at the table of those conversations. I, I feel very strange when there's, you know, a dynamic of like, we have this money and like you can have some and you can have some and like do whatever. And it's like, I would love for us to develop some sort of community conversation and really target areas that are going to need the funding and really target areas that are going to make that are going to utilize the funding to again create a pipeline for the next generation so whether that's investing in young people and investing in young mainers so that they feel like they can they can put down roots in Portland and and feel like they can have a have a great career once they graduate from high school or once they graduate from college and have kind of a, a, a a path moving forward where they don't feel like they need to leave Maine to make more money. Like I think that that's fantastic. I think when we're talking about the workers of Portland and again the people that have been working throughout the pandemic, how are we showing up for those individuals? I think when we're talking about, you know, the individuals of Portland that are getting priced out through short-term rentals and Airbnbs, how are we making sure that we're allocating the, this funding towards affordable housing and like real affordable housing? But I think all of that comes with community conversations. I don't want it to just be like we're on the council and like maybe you get some, maybe you get some and, and that's it. I, I really want us to, like, like Roberto said, be really specific about where the money is being allocated and have these conversations with the individuals that are the most impacted rather than just making the assumption that like, we know what's best because we aren't living in those, you know, in those positions and those lifestyles. And a big part of like what I do and like what I work in outside of the council is really making sure that we are amplifying and advocating and bringing people to these conversations and saying like, well, what would it look like for you if we had this amount of money? What would you want to use it on? How do we make sure that we talk about this in terms of like climate equity and public transportation and again, housing and racial equity and investing in young people so that they don't leave Maine when they graduate. And that's all we should be empowering the people that are gonna be affected. And we shouldn't really just be sitting at the council level and saying like, here's the decisions that we're making. Because again, this is, Portland is still small enough where we can do these things. And I want us to be able to do it and then utilize that money in a really you know, impactful and specific way all together, rather than having like nine people make that decision. Uh, I love that uh, whole idea process. Um, and I think one of the things that maybe we don't do a great job of in progressive circles is coming up with sort of process for, you know, 
having the most impact uh, and doing the least harm, right? You know, we tend to sort of go for the shiny bobble sometimes. We say, that's a big problem, let's throw some money at that. That's yeah. a big problem, let's throw some money at that, right? But there are a lot of big problems. Yeah. And do you think you have a good process or do you think you have ideas for a good process for identifying where a dollar does the most good? Um, so I think right, often you have to rely on like the people that are closest to doing that work. So like in our, in our case, that tends to be department heads, that tends to be um, city staff. Um, there are a lot of people in the community that are also doing a lot of good work in, in trying to identify um, different approaches, problem solving. Um, so you, you try to, I guess, knock on every door, like ask you know, as many people to be involved in the, in, in the discussions. Ultimately, I'm a strong believer that you got to get to a point of action um, and you have to kind of try things on. Um, at one point, if we keep searching like the perfect policy, you'll, you'll get you know, kind of like that you know, paralysis by analysis, like you, you get stuck not making decisions and then you prolong problems. Um, so uh, we were talking before about how process can be a, a, a way to, to disenfranchise people. So I think that eventually I do believe that we have to have actionable things, get it done, try it on, uh, and then you know, understand that it's a, it's a learning process and it's a ongoing problem so that we have to always reassess and, and figure out if our, if our outcomes are um, what we expect them to be and either carry on or change course. Yeah, I mean, I think there isn't enough of that uh, humility sometimes to admit that we're testing and learning, right? Is, you know, I think one of the problems with political discourse is sometimes it's, you know, people want to stick to their idea because they don't want to lose face like, oh, my idea was crappy, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have to admit like, we that was the wrong idea and mm -hmm. we need to t take a different tack. So mm -hmm. we've got uh, just a couple of minutes here left, uh, sort of a mini lightning round. Victoria, what is something that you are focused on over the next month that maybe someone doesn't know about if they're not in city government? Um, I'm really interested in furthering the work of the Racial Equity Steering Committee. I think that that is really important. I don't want to lose sight of it. I know we're going to be kind of talking about it in a couple of months. Uh, but among other things, I think that that's a focus that I want to have, especially, again, as we're coming into 2022. It's been two years since George Floyd was murdered. It's been two years since we had that moment of saying, like, Black Lives Matter. We're going to start listening and learning, and we're going to start being, you know, more uh, intentional about what we're doing equity wise. And so I think that it's a great moment for us to revisit it, especially as we get into the summer of 2022 and really figure out how we are going to make sure that the things that were talked about in the Racial Equity Steering Committee are actually uh, done at the at the council level and at the city government level. Great. So that's cool. One minute, Roberto. Same question. Um, it's budget season. Um, our municipal budget will probably be a little bit longer of a timeline, but immediately in the next month, the school budget uh, process is happening. Um, he, the superintendent just presented his budget last or this week. Um, I'm really want to make sure that we're all well informed in it. The council has to approve that budget before it goes out to the voters at referendum. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a strong believer in the school's comprehensive plan and, and the direction that we've been heading over the last five years since I've, been, since I've served on the board. And I know that there's a lot of investments that are going to be included in this budget that are going to advance a lot of the work that I championed while I was on the board. Um, so I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on that. I'm looking forward to supporting them you know, as a council and being on this end of the transaction. Excellent. Well. I want to thank you both for being here. Victoria, appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Roberto, this was terrific. Thank you, uh, we want to thank everybody out there in TV land for watching and for being engaged in uh, municipal government. And we want to thank the Portland Media Center for being our host here. You guys always do a great job. And hopefully there's plenty of money in the budget for the Portland Media Center. Uh, so for uh, Pathways to Progress, I'm Sam Feifel. And hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you for watching.